Hello, hello. So, yeah, I know we've already talked a bit about the Mars Perseverance rover already, but there was another Flat Earth video on this that I just couldn't resist responding to. Rather than the previous one with Jake, who really didn't do anything but make sarcastic remarks, Eric Dubé here at least puts a little effort into his arguments. Of course, we're going to debunk it nonetheless. Fun stuff. Last week, NASA, the biggest black budget black hole in existence, sucking in $52 million of American taxpayer money every single day, just spent $2.3 billion of your dollars to allegedly land a remote control car on Mars for the fifth time. If you think everything including the rover itself is fake, why do you take a contradictory step that they even take your tax dollars at all? If they're not actually building rovers and sending astronauts to space, they definitely would not need such a budget. Oh, but for some reason, if the government or NASA says something that gives you ammo, you'd gladly believe it's true, such as their budget. But if they say something about space or what they're doing in space, that's definitely false. Seriously, to fake a landing like this, it wouldn't even require a dozen people. Unless, of course, you believe they're just a bunch of people who didn't do anything in the past couple of years, then last second set up a stage for this live stream, and receive billions of dollars for some reason, then I, I don't know what to say to you. At the very least, you could believe that the government is actually not paying them as much as they say they are, because even setting up a coop like this is not worth $23 billion a year. It's just a more realistic claim, that's all I'm saying. Yes. The multi-billion dollar charade of landing on Mars has been happening since 1976, and thanks to the gullible, unquestioning masses enthralled and duped by these ridiculous Hollywood performances, they will most likely continue for decades to come. Well, I sure hope NASA stays around until the end of time. And here's something that I've wanted to say to Flat Earthers for a while now. How narcissistic do you have to be to believe that everyone on Earth falsely believes in a government lie, and you, along with your little group of friends, has seen through the truth? It's such an elitist thing to even think, that you somehow transcend everyone else in intellect, including those with PhDs. Please, don't get full of yourself. You're just an average person, and well below average in terms of IQ. Your brain is so smooth, you probably apply lotion to it every day. To begin with, the tiny reddish circular light in the sky known as Mars is not a spherical terra firma world millions of miles away capable of landing a rover on. Oh good, yeah, just give us these outrageous claims without providing any backup evidence whatsoever. Feels like I'm so used to this by now that it took me a second to even think about pointing that out. All of the so-called planets were known to the ancients as wandering stars because they differ from the fixed stars in their relative motions only. To them, stars were not spherical worlds millions of miles away, or suns trillions of miles away, as we are brainwashed to believe they are today. Why do flat earthers even bring up ancient people and what they believed in? Who in the world cares? Who cares that they believed in flat earth? Who cares that they believed in a stationary sun? Who cares what they thought about planets? Why does that help your argument at all? If anything, that would weaken your argument because they had such outdated information and did not have access to the knowledge we have today. You know what else ancient people believed in? Zeus. And I don't see you praying to him in hopes that he would throw his lightning bolt and blow up NASA. Stars were and are simply luminaries immaterial lights in the sky, several thousand, not millions, of miles away. Wow, what fantastic evidence you presented there. No, wait, you didn't give us any. The Masonic magicians at NASA and the other world space agencies, using lying actor knots and Hollywood tricks like green screens, wires, harnesses, and endless amounts of CGI images, through pseudoscience books and programs, mass media and public education, Universities and government propaganda have systematically indoctrinated the entire world into believing what is nothing but an elaborate piece of science fiction. Okay, so I'm going to address the footage you had playing in the background. You expect a regular photo camera to have good resolution for a planet hundreds of millions of kilometers away? Nothing you see in the sky is how it actually looks. There are many ways in which light can get distorted before it reaches your camera, especially if it's traveling through the Earth's atmosphere. Instead, if you take pictures from space with very high resolution cameras, then you can more clearly see what the planet looks like. Oh. <laughs> Wait, we've already done that. Plus, if NASA really wanted to fake an image, they wouldn't even need to make it look so complex or different than what you see in the night sky. After all, why would they? Keeping it simple would be more convincing to people if they were truly trying to trick the public. As you can clearly see for yourself with a bit of research, a telescope or high zoom camera, and an open, discerning mind actually honestly admitting to yourself what is and what isn't a CGI, computer-generated image, it is obvious that the light in the sky known as Mars is not some science fiction desert planet millions of miles away. 
you have reached that conclusion literally from looking through a camera on Earth. You didn't do any measurements, no data, no reasoning, just, hey, it doesn't look like a rocky ball, so it can't be one. You think it's just some light in the sky, right? Okay, so let me help you out here. You can start by taking some measurements of the light intensity and give us a pattern on how its illumination works. Then you can try mapping it out in the sky using objective coordinates. Then you can actually send something up there and collect other bits of data, such as what the light source is, how is it being operated, what its composition is, how it's hanging in the sky, etc. The more data you collect, the better. Then start piecing it all together and give us a conclusion by writing a paper. That's a very dumbed down process, but it's a good starting point. You can't just sit there and claim it's a light in the sky and that it's not a planet without giving some sort of data, calculation, or evidence. Looking through a telescope is definitely not enough, so you have to go further. That's how you produce objective evidence. Meanwhile, the actual photographs NASA claims are coming from this completely other world look exactly like they are coming from Devon Island, Canada, with a red tint added in post-processing. There is nothing being shown in NASA's photographs of Mars that cannot easily be faked on Earth. Okay, so he then shows a series of images of comparison between the surface of Mars and Devon Island. Before I get into the island itself, I would like to say that there are no sources for where these images even came from. And I even tried looking around myself, but it seems like whoever posted the first comparison of images like this surely did not want people to question his sources. That being said, this is most likely someone who took either photos from Devon Island and applied a red filter to it to trick people into believing NASA is taking photos, or the other way around. Without seeing sources, we will never know which is true. But again, I have to bring back the same argument. If NASA has such a high budget and they went out of their way to carefully CGI other images such as ones of Earth and other planets to perfection, why would they post such lazy images taken from Devon Island and apply a simple filter that any 10 year old could do? Your story simply just doesn't sell. There's no reason they wouldn't CGI the Mars surface images either. Second, I do want to talk about Devon Island a bit since many of you may be curious. It's an uninhabited island in Canada that interestingly has very similar surface compositions compared to that of Mars. The rocks are very similar, so that has attracted a lot of attention from scientists. After all, you could use this island to really get a feel for what the surface of Mars would look like. And since it's uninhabited, you don't need anyone's permission. Of course, there are some wildlife there, but they are pretty scarce, so not much to worry about. A good place to shoot a film on Mars, but The Martian was actually filmed elsewhere. Yes, that's right. How do you think NASA sends and receives all data to and from this remote control car? They apparently have internet technology so strong and fast that they can operate a remote control vehicle from tens of millions of miles away. Are you going to at least do a simple Google search before embarrassing yourself on the internet? No? Okay. Obviously the signals they receive is not the internet or Wi-Fi. Seriously, you flat earthers are so small brained you can't even imagine that technology exists beyond what you use in your everyday lives. These waves can travel for incredibly long distances and can send a large amount of information back and forth. That's sort of why we say that space seems pretty empty of life. Anyway, that's a topic for another video. The point is, radio waves, radio waves, radio waves. And depending on what kind of signal we are transmitting, it could take a differing amount of time. Images we take from Mars, for example, could take a while. But if we're controlling the rover, obviously that would be shorter. Fun fact, since radio waves cannot travel faster than the speed of light, the shortest delay we could ever have here is about 3 minutes. Can you imagine playing a computer game? with three minutes of input delay? Literally unplayable. Do we the public have any independent evidence whatsoever that such technology actually exists? Of course not. I mean, if you've used a radio at all, then it's pretty much the same thing. Again, because the science fiction indoctrinated masses are so bedazzled by their pseudoscientific priests at NASA that they don't require things like proof or evidence. No, it's because we actually know how it works and you can't even be bothered to do a simple Google search. Typical flat brainer. When they are pressed on such matters, like the original moon landing tapes, LEM blueprints, telemetry data, and other physical proof, NASA says they filmed over the original moon landing tapes and conveniently lost all the physical evidence. As NASA actor not Don Pettit stated, I would go back to the moon in a nanosecond, but we destroyed that technology, and it's a painful process to build it back again. So that is their excuse for why we haven't been back to the moon in 50 years. Because they destroyed the technology, and it's a painful process to build it back again. I don't know where you heard that the technology was destroyed, rather if we do decide to go back to the moon that requires a lot of planning and a lot of building in general. All of this would cost money, which is why it hasn't really been done again. I say really because we actually do have plans to go back in 2024. In fact, there's been a discussion on building a moon base and potentially using it as a refueling station for future space missions. Basically, we suspect that there is an ice repository on the moon, and if we could extract water from it then we can turn it into rocket fuel. 
It's a pretty simple concept. So once that happens in 2024, you bet I'm going to be making a video on it when Flat Earthers return to being in shambles again. Anyway, the point is we haven't been back to the moon in decades because of the cost and possibly lack of interest up until now. Sending human beings to the moon is a lot more difficult than sending them to the International Space Station. Back in the 20th century, competition really drove incentives, so that's how we were able to do it. If we had a similar motive now, or if NASA has a bigger budget, I'm sure we would have sent human beings to the moon by now. Now let's talk about the supposed parachutes deployed by these rovers when landing. NASA says the surface pressure on Mars is only three-tenths of one percent of the surface pressure on Earth, and equivalent to the pressure at about 23 miles above Earth. This fact alone blows their hoax out of the water. Any skydiver knows there is not nearly enough air matter at that pressure to provide any kind of lift for opening and billowing out the parachutes NASA uses to land its Mars probes. No parachute ever devised has been able to successfully deploy at that altitude. What? How would skydivers know? How would anyone know just from experience? There hasn't been a single plane that has even reached close to that altitude, so how could anyone have used a parachute there? Plus, skydivers would use their parachute at maybe, I don't know, just under 2 kilometers above sea level, which is only a fraction of the 30 kilometer altitude we're using to compare to Mars's atmosphere. But yeah, parachutes can be very effective, especially considering the fact that the Mars terminal velocity is about 5 times compared to that of Earth. Basically what I'm saying is, even though the atmosphere is less than 1% than what we're used to on Earth, Earth, the sheer speed that the spacecraft is falling is enough for the atmosphere to have a major impact on the rover. That's why the rover itself, as I mentioned in the previous video, can reach incredibly high temperatures. When you're going that fast, the thin atmosphere is no longer thin since you're just running into so many air particles. That's why the parachute can work effectively to slow down the rover. And if the situation gets dicey, there's also rocket-assisted descent motors to help slow down the rover, along with cushions to soften the blow. By the way, this is another situation in which you're just bringing up an anecdote in your own intuition when describing something of science, which is incredibly dangerous and misleading. Your own thoughts and experiences differ completely than what would practically happen in the atmosphere of Mars. Take a step back and think. First, can a skydiver ever reach that altitude on Earth? Second, would a skydiver ever reach terminal velocity? Seriously, think about your own claims first before posting your thoughts on the internet. NASA.gov says that, quote, the Perseverance spacecraft departs Earth at a speed of about 24,600 miles per hour, about 39,600 kilometers per hour. The trip to Mars will take about seven months and about 300 million miles, 480 million kilometers. The actual fastest vehicle that exists is the SR-71 Blackbird fighter jet, which can travel an incredible Mach 3.3 or 2100 miles per hour. With no evidence whatsoever, NASA claims this ridiculous looking CGI cupcake on a hut plate can achieve speeds 12 times faster than the fastest actual flying vehicle in the world. There you go again, comparing to things that you know in your own life. Obviously things can travel much faster in space because guess what? It's space. There's no air resistance to slow you down, so once you fly in one direction, you just keep going in that direction. Any acceleration is added on instead of fighting against atmospheric particles. Anyway, I'm going to end the video here since this monotone voice is too boring to listen to. All these flat earthers being in shambles on the internet is music to my ears. Thank you to my patrons Fireshard, Alan Morton, JN, and Miss Fixit for supporting this channel, and I'll see you next week, hopefully on a new topic.